Amen, amen, amen. Isn't that a beautiful song? And it's important that we, as we sing this, we don't just look at this as oh, just another a, a feel-good song. What we're doing is, and, and I want you to understand something, the reminding part, we're not reminding God about how good he is. Every time we say it, we're reminding ourselves of how good God is. Maybe you're in this place right now, and you might be saying, I, I don't know. Maybe you're going through a struggle right now. Maybe you're unable to even understand or comprehend as we're singing, and you're like, man, what? the person next to me is so joyful. They got their hands up. They're jumping around and singing. Maybe that's you in this place right now. It's, and I, I just want to say this, because I was once there. But by the end of this service, my prayer is not that you get a good word. It's not that you just get a good, a, a good feeling from being here. I'm praying that God will touch you in a way that will change your life forever. So with that being said, Father, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. We hand this time over to you. We thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. Father, we thank you for the power that you have, Lord, to transform hearts, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit be in this place. We pray that every word that is spoken would be of you. I step aside and I give you full access to this word tonight. Use me as you see fit. Father, we lift up all of our leaders and our pastors. Father, we lift up Pastor Marco where he is tonight, Father. Continue to give him rest and strength, Father God. We thank you for what you're going to do tonight. We come expecting to see you move. We didn't just show up here just to fill a seat. We came here to learn, to be changed, to be transformed. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. All right, all right. High five the person next to you. So my name is Chris. Um, I'm... <laughs> I, I, I am the campus pastor for our Pomona campus. And, and, and we have some exciting things going on over there. I wish I had another 30 minutes to tell you all about it, but I do not. But I truly believe that God has given a word tonight. And, and it's on overcoming anger. I don't know why I was chose to pick this one. But anger is one of the many things that I learned to overcome. And tonight, this is exactly what we're going to dive into. And, I, and, and this is more of a teaching. And I know a lot of times you can see me up here when I had the opportunity to come here. And I run around and, and the Holy Spirit's moving and it's impactful. But I, I have to, I want to bring it back tonight. This lesson, this is a teaching. And the reason, it, or maybe, I don't know, Holy Spirit might just take over and turn this all around. But I know what he prepared me for. And it's important that we overcome this spirit. And I want you to understand something. This is a spirit. But I want you to get the full information of the spirit that we're going to overcome. Without this information, we're too easily pulled back into situations. We're too easily pulled back and overcome by these things that we thought we were set free from. Does that make sense? Okay. So feeling anger. Okay, here we go. Feeling anger is a natural part of life, but it is not necessarily in an emotion that we are comfortable with or have, taught or have been taught to manage skillfully. You get what I just said? While anger is often seen as a bad or unchristian, it is important to our spiritual health. Do you hear what I say? You might have walked in this place. Oh, great, I'm going to learn how to overcome all this anger. We are. But I need you to understand that there's more to anger. 
There's two sides to anger. And as we dive into this, we're going to understand that anger, the right kind of anger, is important to your spiritual walk. You're saying, how, what do you mean? Anger is, is, is good for my growth? Well, check this out. When we have a fever, right? A fever is telling us something is wrong in our body, right? We don't just pop an aspirin, or some, maybe some of you do, and think, okay, it's going to all be better now. In fact, what the fever is doing is warning you. It's telling you that there's a deeper underlying issue. And just the same way with anger. Anger can show us. Anger can come into a place where we see, we're like, man, why is something rising up in me? How many of you, you ever fasted and anger seems to be the first thing that rises? Right? But I want, I, we're going to dive into this, but I want you to know something. Anger is a secondary emotion. Ooh. You're like, so it's not just anger? No, it sure isn't. But look at this. So today we're going to go over and we're going to touch on a couple of things here. I'm going to show you what anger is, how God views anger, some of the consequences of anger. Oh, some of you are all like, I already know all those, Pastor. How do we overcome anger? So today, who's ready to grow? Say it. I'm ready to grow. What? It, we're going to declare this thing. I'm growing today. And the reason is, is so that when we grow, we get a word like today. We get it. We take it in. We receive it. And we make changes. Don't just come into this place to get a word, to go out the same exact way you were when you came in. We come to change, right? Look at this in Colossians 3.8. It says this, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Mm, that last one hit somebody right now. I heard it. So what is anger? All the time. All the time. Especially when you're on that job site. Look at this. This is Webster's Dictionary of what anger is. It is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. I went and I got a couple of di different uh, definitions here. I went into the Oxford Dictionary, and it says this, the strong feeling that you have when something has happened that you think is bad or unfair. And here's the biblical definition. A passionate, which is a strong feeling, a passionate and active response to, to the entire person to the real or perceived wrong. Look at all of these. Every single definition lines up with this. Anger is a feeling. It's an emotion. Some of you are, yeah, Pastor, I know that. I came to get more, please. Hold on, we're getting there. It is an, anger is a feeling or an emotion that often leads to an active response. And just like any other feeling, we as believers are called to control it. I want to ask you a question. How many of you in this place have never dealt with anger at all? Oh, I saw one. I saw you. Okay, we're going to pray. You're going to be the first one up here afterwards. So this message right now is for every single person. And what we're going to do right now, we're going to jump in. As we dive in, we're going to identify what anger is. Although anger, anger is mostly identified as a negative emotion, it is important that we understand where it came from. Where do you think anger came from? Where do you think anger came from? Somebody, shut it out. From God, from the devil. I've heard a couple. Listen to this. Anger is a God-given emotion of displeasure. The devil can't, devil can't give you something takes from you, right? 
God can feel anger. And Jesus even manifested anger when he entered the synagogue and saw the hardness of the hearts of the people. We saw this, and you could look in, in, Mac, in Mark uh, 3, 5. Anger expresses that I am against something, and I take an active stance to oppose what is wrong. This is what anger is. We've seen it all throughout the Old Testament, right? God got angry. You think that came from the devil? No. It was an emotion. But the Bible describes that there is two different kinds of anger. Here we go. You all ready? Where are my note takers at? All right. All right. Write this down. I'm going to go fast. Number one, there is a righteous anger that is acceptable to God. Look at this in Ephesians 4.26. Be angry and do not sin. Is God telling you, be angry, but do not sin. I'm not getting, God is not saying this and don't go jump in your car and start driving all crazy and get in an argument with your wife and go off. Well, pastor said to be angry. Hold up. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Number two, a sinful anger is unacceptable to God. So there's a righteous anger that's acceptable to God, and there's a sinful anger that is unacceptable to God. You guys with me? In Ephesians 4.31, it says this, let all bitterness, we're defining this, all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. I want you to understand something. That our motive and how we express our anger shows exactly what kind of anger that we're dealing with. You got that? How we react to a situation will show what kind of anger we're dealing with. A righteous anger focuses on God and his kingdom, his rights and concerns. It is God-centered motives that drive righteous anger and should drive us to seek a righteous response. So don't say, oh, well, somebody was blaspheming God, so I punched him in the face. That's not the way it works. Not only do we have to stand up for what is right, but we have to make sure that we take a stand in the right way. Right? Okay, unrighteous and sinful anger is focused on me and my kingdom and my rights and my concerns. It is self-centered motives that drive this kind of anger and will drive an unrighteous response. I want you to stop and I want you to think about the last argument you got in. You're like, oh, that's easy. It was right before we walked in. <laughs> I really want you to stop. Just think. The last time I got upset, was it over you? Was it about your kingdom? Was it about your rights? Oh, well, she ain't listening to me. She didn't cook the thing, this the way I wanted it to be cooked. Started a big old argument, right? Oh, he didn't do his laundry. I don't like picking up after him. What was your last argument about? And guys, I'm not pointing fingers because I am so guilty of this. But it's important that we check it, right? Understanding that this kind of anger is not the righteous anger of God. In fact, it's contrary too. It's a sinful anger. Mm, it got real quiet right now, guys. Like I could probably hear a pin drop. The difference here is righteous anger focuses on how people have offended God and his name and not me and my name. It focuses on God 
and not self. This is the emotion that God gave us. And yes, us in our sinful nature, we have abused it. We've made it about us. Not only is this the response that we have anger that we have to check for, but it is also what kind of anger that we are holding on to that is sinful. So I want you to understand, it's not just how we respond, it's what kind of anger are we holding inside of us? Because there's people that can, may go on throughout the day and never even knew you were angry, right? And you say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a holy anger. It's justified anger. Nobody knows about it, and that's fine. But, I want, but we know now, we are understanding, we are learning what a righteous anger is. And if it doesn't have anything to do with God... We need to get rid of it right away because it's dealing with self, right? Come on, guy. I, somebody tonight is going to get set free of the selfishness. Somebody tonight is going to get set free of this unrighteous anger you've been holding on to. I truly believe that today we can overcome this thing. I'm going to give you the reason why. I don't want to jump ahead. I have a tendency to do that. I give you the end. But look at this. And just like any other sin, it is important that we uproot it and get rid of it. Or it can and will influence and affect our inheritance. You're like, what? what? I have an inheritance? Hold up. Maybe. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says this. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, here we go, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Somebody's like, I never saw that part. <laughs> Selfish ambition, right, division, Envy, drunkenness, wicked part or wild parties, and other sins like these. Look at this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, this wasn't the first time he said it, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we are holding on or reacting to anger, in an unrighteous way, not my words, guys, but the word, says that we will not inherit the kingdom of God. I truly believe anger is one of the, like, underlying, people try to sweep it under the rug. They try to excuse it. It's not like, oh, well, I, I gave up drugs. I gave up alcohol. I stopped going out on, on my wife or my, my husband. And they're still dealing with this anger sin, this sinful nature, right? So that's one of the consequences that we face when we're dealing with unrighteous anger is that anger interferes with our inheritance, our eternity. Number two, anger affects our physical health. I, look, I had to look this up. I was a little skeptical. I was like, man, how could something, this, this, this is, this is a, an emotion, spiritual. How, how, is, how can this affect? But look at this. Doctors and scientists alike have found that short-term and long-term physical effects of uncontrolled anger include increased anxiety, ooh, high blood pressure, headaches, um, digestive problems, abdominal pain, insomnia, depression, skin problems like eczema, Heart attack, increased heart attacks, heart disease, and a higher risk of strokes. That's all from holding on to an unrighteous anger. That's crazy. Some of us, man, we keep on going to the doctor. Doctor, I don't understand what's wrong with me. Doctor can't even explain it either. I don't even know how you have high cholesterol. I'm these, these, oh, you're about to have a heart attack. I don't even understand. You look healthy to me telling you right now, some of us don't got a, 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 a physical problem. We don't have a physical sickness. What we have is we have an anger issue. 
There's some people that have gone to doctors and they're telling you and they're like, man, I, I feel great. And they've had a heart attack. They don't understand. How did that even happen? But they're under extreme stress. They're holding on to things that God never intended them to hold on to. It doesn't just make you spiritually sick. It affects your physical as well. So anger, number three, anger can control you. Oh, mm. Anger can control you. Like, it ain't got me. Let, me. let me ask you something. Have you ever been in a place you never wanted to be? Because of a bad decision you made? Anger controlled you. Have you ever spoke words and you've hurt family members or you've hurt yourself? Anger controlled you. We're not talking about that it dri it's driving you in circles, but it just takes a second to get you. You can make a decision that can cost you the rest of your life behind anger. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So, anger can drive you places that you never wanted to go. The wrong response in anger can lead to consequences that can last much longer than the time it took to be angry. Even when, you act in, when acting in impulse, we are no different. Here we go. I always do these. I don't know. I don't know how you're going to take this. And, and wives, don't look at your husbands right now. Wives, don't look at your husbands. I'm just saying. When we are acting in impulse, like we can't control it, we are no better than animals or toddlers. I want you to think about this. Animals act and react, right? Toddlers work on a reaction. I got little grandbabies. One of them hits the other one. One's two years old, the other one's three years old. One gets hit, the other one cries, and then it hits back. They start fighting over what? We look the same exact way when we do not use self-control. Oh, my wife, she don't respect me, so I had to go upside her head. <laughs> Kidding me? Oh, well, he, he don't act right, so I flipped out on him in front of everybody. It, what? We have, to be, we have to get our emotions under control. If not, we look no different. Oh, well, that's just the way I am. That's not the way you were created. That's not how God created you. Somewhere along the line, you picked something up that you didn't let go. I'm talking to me first, so no stones. <laughs> but look at this. In Ephesians 4.26, it says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. <clears throat> when we are angry, we may do something we might regret later on and act in a way that can hurt others around us or even ourselves. Number four. Anger opens up the door to the devil and temptation. Ooh, you knew I was coming with this. In Ephesians 4.27, it says, For anger gives a foothold to the devil. We're talking about this unrighteous anger. I didn't even stick around with the righteous anger. I think we understand that. But this unrighteous anger opens the doors for the enemy. And let me tell you, not just for you, for your husband, for your wife, for your household, for generations to come. If you don't get a foothold on this, guess what? The enemy got it. Don't worry, he's happy to take the place. Anger leaves us wide open to temptation and Satan's attacks on our spiritual life. When anger comes in one door, our spiritual life goes out the other. And what I mean by that is our spiritual way of thinking, our spiritual way of speaking, 
acting and responsive, favor, grace, etc. It goes on. But how many of you know when, man, all of a sudden we let that unrighteous anger creep in, it's not checked, we respond in a way that we know that we shouldn't, everything that we were praying for 20 minutes earlier, oh, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for my husband. I thank you for my wife. They're so amazing. And then they make you mad. And then you start popping off. Your kids, you're asking, thank you, Lord, for the blessings of my children. They do something crazy and you start popping off. Guess what? You forgot all the blessings that you just were talking about, right? We have to be careful. The enemy is crouching. He's crouching. He's ready. My little granddaughter, she's two. She is grandpa's girl. Like, oh, my goodness. Ridiculous. I come in the door, she, that's the first, she comes darting to me. And then if I try to go to my bedroom, she beats me there so that I can't close the door and kick her out. <laughs> and if I do close the door, she's crying, right? But she's crouching, she's waiting for me to come in the door. She sees me, she's already got her eyes focused. The enemy is the same way. He's crouching. He's ready to attack. He's waiting for you to mess up. He's waiting for you to start speaking bad. He's waiting for it. We have to be able to get this under control before it happens. I'm speaking to somebody tonight. Pastor Marco said last week that, that there was cousins to, um, what were we overcoming last week? We overcame fear, right? And there was cousins to fear. There's cousins to anger. Look at this bitterness, wrath, resentment, unforgiveness, hatred, and murder. Paul was, uh, King Saul was a great example of this. King Saul is, is, is one, I don't know if everybody knows, but King Saul was the first king of Israel, and Saul became very jealous of a young man named David. Uh, Saul was so jealous of David that he tried to kill him on several occasions. He let his anger take over, and he became a monster. Understand, Paul did not start off a monster, right? He was anointed to be in that position. But he allowed these cousins of anger begin to build up. And they were unchecked feelings. So they begin to turn into wrath. They begin to turn into murder, right? So it is a, it is a secondary emotion. And a lot of times it comes from this. Fear, sadness, feeling powerless, feeling rejected, being, being treated unfairly, etc. It goes on and on. And like with Saul, it started with his jealousy. Then anger started. Before anger gets there, when we begin to see the cousin spring up inside of us, we need to come to a place where we check them, right? So you're like, come on, Pastor, I need to get over some of this stuff. Let's go. So number one, this is how we're going to get over. We're going to overcome. Not just overcome, we're going to overcome God's way. I think it's important that we understand this. That we're not doing this, uh, this is not a 12-step program. This is not, oh, these are pretty good ideas. We're going to go and we're going to get into the Word of God and how God says to overcome these things. In Proverbs 29, 11, it says this. Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. The number one way. To get a hold on this thing is to control it. it. says, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. This scripture does not mean that the wise bury their anger and do not deal with it. I want you to understand that. Like, oh, I'm just going to suppress it. Now I got an ulcer. Come on. <laughs> but it means that they control their anger and how they express it. When you control your anger, 
you keep it within limits, right? Number two, we check it. We reevaluate. In James 1, 19 through 20, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You get that? What does that mean? That means shut your mouth. Hold up. Man, what's that old saying? Mama said, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. Start putting that to practice. We need to begin to be a people who are slow to speak. It will save us a whole lot. And there's a reason why I said that first. Because when we're slow to speak, we have a, t we have a moment to think. Tell you right now, when you're speaking, you ain't thinking, right? So God's way of dealing with anger is to be slow to anger. There are some things that you need to let roll off your shoulders and not look over and not continue to, to overthink or act on. When you reevaluate a person's words or actions, you often find that there's no need to get angry as that person really did not intend to hurt you or was merely acting out of their own hurt or frustration, which is not a reflection of you. I looked up, there's, there's this, uh, these scientists that said that, uh, and it, I don't know if it's true or not, I'm not a scientist, but they, they're, they go in and there's this, this group of cells, and it's called the 90 second rule. Scientists call it experiencing anger when it's called anger circuit. In our brain, there's this group of cells that is stimulated and it triggers anger. But what they found was that if they waited 90 seconds, the person had to choose to wait for 90 seconds. After the 90 seconds was over, it settled down. God spoke that word over 2000, about 2,000 years ago. And he said to be slow, to be angry. And now the scientists are saying, yeah, be slow, wait. Wait 90 seconds. God already set it up. He already told us. I just love how science is catching up with God's word. So number three. Okay, we got it, right? Number one was what? Control it. We have to control it. Number two, check it, right? And number three, let it go. Mm. Some of us, that's a hard one. We were all good up until, yeah, pastor, good. Yeah, number one, got it. Number two, got it. Whoa, whoa, let it go. God is not giving you permission to hold on to the things that destroy you. If we know now we are sitting here, we understood, we saw what the doctors said, and you can look this up. This isn't me just coming up with some stuff. I did research. Anger destroys you, not just spiritually, but physically. God has not given us permission to hold on to this, right? So what do we do with it then? What do we do with this, this built up? We've already got it. We know that we have to check it, okay? I, I'm, I'm calm. I, I didn't react, okay? I'm reevaluating, but it's still there. Right? Now what do I do with it? We take it to God. I love our counseling department, guys. Absolutely love our give Christy, Christy. Give it up for Christy. But guys, and all of our counselors here. But our greatest counselor is God. We don't need to go to an outside source all these health, wellness, and this, that, and the other, and we, we go, and we have to make sure that we're not going to TikTok and we're venting. We're going to Facebook and we're venting. We're going, I don't know what all these other, uh, Instagram and we're venting, right? We're telling the whole world our issues. I'm like, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I agree with you, girl. You need to leave him. He ain't no good, right? But instead, we take it to God. Anybody who's ever gone through anything, <coughs> anybody who's ever vented on that kind of platform, it never makes you feel better. It never gives you positivity. It doesn't give you hope. It doesn't give you reassurance. But when you take it to God, right, you can release it. Guys, you're not here. Oh, let me jump in here really quick. In Psalms 522, it says, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. That's been some of our problem. We've been doing everything else except taking it to God. We take it to God, then we release it. But it, is, it isn't just as important that we are being real with God. It is okay to pray about your anger. Some of you are like, man, what, wait a minute. I can talk to God like that? You sure can. But look at this. Don't start complaining or venting to the wrong things, to coworkers, to neighbors, to friends. As believers, we take it to God. And what you will find when you do this thoroughly and you have thoroughly expressed yourself and, what, and how you feel, you will be in a better place. King David was a great example of letting everything out for as long as it took. In Psalm 6, 6 through 7, it says this, I am worn out from sobbing all night. I flood my bed with weeping drenching in my tears. My vision is blurred of grief, by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all of my enemies. David let it all out to God. It took him all night sobbing, right? But look at this. He also did this. David was also brutally honest with God. That is exactly what God wants from us. To pray what is really in us, not what we think God wants to hear. David was so real. Look, look at this. And I'm not saying to do this, but look at this. In Psalms 109, 9 and 11, it says this. May his children be fatherless and may a creditor seize all that he has. He was being brutally honest in the way that he felt. He was like, man, Lord, I hate this guy. Let his children be fatherless. I'm not saying go do this prayer, guys. But what David was being is he was being brutally honest. He was being raw with God. God doesn't want to hear your simple prayers. Of, oh, okay, Lord. Yeah, no, I know you're going to work it all out. Don't get me wrong. We're, we're going to speak it. But be real with him. He created you. He knows your heart. He knows every thought. He knows what you're going through. David was real with God. And he went on to say, in Psalms 109, 22, he did explain himself. And he said, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is full of pain. God knew it. He understood. God's not sitting here judging you. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe you just said that. It was in your heart. He already knew. Right? But it's important. Guys, try to suppress or to, to, to deny our emotions will prevent you from working through them. When we are real with ourselves and real with God, we will be in a real place for change. That's part of our issues. When we set ourselves up for change, it will change our mind, it will change our hearts, and it will change our reactions, which in turn will change our results. I want you to think right now. And I want you to ask yourself this. What is it inside of me that I'm holding on to? What is it inside of me that I haven't let go for? Maybe it's your past. Because like we said, these are secondary emotions. What 
right now are you holding on to that might be hindering you from a full relationship with God? And don't think for one second that it's not hindering your relationship. Be real with yourself. You can hear a hundred sermons. You can read a hundred scriptures. And nothing will change unless you begin to look internally. This message isn't for the person next to you. To the right, to the left, behind you. That's why I said don't look at your spouse. This word is for you. There's real change. There's real change that can take place tonight. And I want you to understand, I gave you three really good reasons, but the the greatest thing, the only thing that can truly change you from the inside out is God. It's his Holy Spirit that can come in and it can change you in a split second if you allow it. Today, we're, I'm believing, I've been praying, I've been fasting, I, I believe, and even if it's just one person that is touched by today's message, maybe it's online, I don't know. But today, if that's you and you're saying, man, I need to get rid of this, this is destroying my life. This is what I'm here for. This is what this word was here for. At this moment, I'm going to ask, go ahead, everybody just go ahead and stand up. And we're going to close out right now. Nobody take off, nobody run away really quickly. There's people that are going to come up here, and I don't want any distractions. I know there's some people that have to get in position to serve. But this is an important moment. If understanding what anger does to your body spiritually or physically and spiritually, and coming to an understanding today that this doesn't just affect you, but it affects your generations to come. Who here today is willing to take a stand against it? By a show of hands, I'm going to count to three really quickly. Who's willing to take a stand and say, this will not be passed on to my next generation? One, two, three. By a show of hands, I see all your hands. I see all of your hands. Really quickly, I want you to come up. If you put your hand up, come up here right now. We're believing. We're believing right now. Generational curses are going to be broken in the name of Jesus. There are people that are going to overcome right now just by raising their hand. Come up, come up quickly. If you put your hand up, come up quickly. Even if you didn't put your hand up and you're saying, I'm done with this. Come up. I have one more call. Well, I have two more calls, guys. Really quickly, we said this. We will never leave a service without giving opportunity for every single person in this place to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If that's you and you're in this place tonight, maybe you're saying, I don't have a relationship with God, but I know I need one. I know I need one. I believe God is already pressing on your heart. We serve such an amazing God, a loving God. If you're, th- if you're in this place and you're saying, I've never had that. Or maybe you're in this place and you're saying, man, you know what? I've, I've, I've fallen back. I'm in this place. Somebody invited me. I'm backslidden. And you're in this place and you're saying, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I need change. Let me tell you, you are in the best place possible tonight. If you're saying, that's me, Pastor... I need to come back. Our God is so loving. He is so faithful that he says this. Just come, son. Just come, daughter. Don't worry about it. I know you messed up. You know you messed up. But just come back. If that's you today, if you're in one of those two categories, I'm just going to ask on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand if that's you. See your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand in the back. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Right now, those that raise their hand, and maybe you didn't even raise your hand. 
Maybe your heart is beating right now. Maybe your feet feel like you got cinder blocks on them. Maybe your hands are numbing up and you're like, man, I don't want to go up there. I know I need to be up there. I'm asking you right now, just take the bold step and come up and allow us to pray for you. I promise it's nothing weird. We just want to pray with you. We're going to pull you in to a relationship with God today. You will not leave this place the same way you walked in. So if that's you, just come up. I know that altar's packed. All right, guys. Any more leaders? Is there any more leaders? Calling leaders? All right, all right. So my last call, and then we're out of here. I think I got three minutes, right? Okay. This is my last call, and I've always made it a personal call that I will never leave a stage without asking this. How many of you out there have a crazy family member? Okay, that's a lot of people. How many of you right now have a family member that you don't know where they would go today if they were to die? And according to the Bible, it doesn't look good, right? That's a lot of hands. And I know there's a lot more because all of us ain't got like perfect families. But guys, there's power in prayer. There's power in unity, in agreement, in prayer. Understand, I am a product of prayer. If there wasn't a woman that was praying for me when everybody else said, no, he's no good, he'll never change, I don't know where I would be. When there was a call, just like right now, she came up and got prayer. She began to pray for me. Ten years later, here I am. Do not, do not underestimate the power in coming in unity, in agreement, in prayer. So if that's you right now, you said, I am taking a stand today for my family, my children. My children are coming home. My husband's coming back. My wife's coming back. I don't care what it looks like right now. I'm believing that through this prayer, there's going to be change. So if that's you, you put your hand up. Come on. Let's come up. Let's pray. We're going to come into agreement right now. I don't even know if we can fit anymore, huh? All right, with this being said, guys, this is your first step. For those of you that came up right now, this is your first step. There's holy warriors, right? Do not leave this place without get, us getting your information. We're gonna get you connected. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, go ahead and repeat this prayer after me. Father, forgive me. I know I've sinned. I know I've done things my way, but today I turn to you. I repent. I turn from my old way of living and I turn to you. I ask you now to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I ask you now to give me the strength to walk this out. I ask you now to give me the strength to be a light in the darkness. I thank you, God, for your son that you sent to die for me. And I receive the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I make you Lord today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Give it up for everybody who came up here, guys. God bless you. Thank you for having me.